Hello friends, I hope you are doing great. It's a beautiful evening here. IBM is here with another episode of Learning Physics and I want to take you to episode 6 of Waves and Superposition. Without wasting time, I want us to pick up from where we stopped in episode 5. So in episode 5, I think we stopped on page uh, 116 and I want us to start from the same page. So uh, we were supposed to go to this question. A pattern of waves uh, observed without being able to view the source of the waves. A pattern of waves was observed without being able to view the source of the waves. The pattern is represented in the diagram. Okay. So we have a region of minimum intensity. That's where we have the gaps. And region of maximum intensity. That's where we have the solid lines. What can cause this pattern? Uh, how can we be able to, call, to see regions of minimum intensity and regions of maximum intensity? For regions of minimum intensity and regions of maximum intensity to be observed, there must have been interference. And interference, since we don't see the sources, interference could also be as a result of diffraction. Waves from two different sources, as they undergo diffraction, they spread and then they superpose causing interference patterns, that is, alternating regions of maximum intensity and regions of minimum intensity. Therefore, our answer in this is going to be uh, diffraction and interference. Diffraction alone cannot cause those interference patterns, and interference without diffraction uh, may not also cause those, inter uh, those patterns. So, Normally, when we talk about inter diffraction, it is most likely going to result into interference patterns. So as two, as waves spread into regions of geometric shadow, uh, waves from one source may, in, may overlap with the waves from another source, and the interference results into alternating regions of maximum and minimum intensity. So it's always both diffraction and interference that will cause such regions. A cathode ray oscilloscope is used to display the trace from a sound wave. The time base is set to 5 microseconds per millimeter. What is the frequency of the sound wave? So we can check uh, the wave here. I can start from here. One cycle. Uh, is, it, is it one cycle? Let me rub off this. Okay. So I can assume that approximately one cycle is starting from this point up to this point, approximately. And this is one, uh, one cycle is starting from, say, this point up to this point. So this will be one, two, three. That is three centimeters representing one cycle. Three centimeters are representing one cycle. What is the frequency? So to find the frequency, we get one over the period which will be 1 over the length of the one cycle times the time base setting. So the frequency is going to be 1 over 1 cycle is 3 centimeters times the time base setting, which is 5, micro is times 10 power negative 6 seconds per centimeter. So per centimeter is cancelled. So I will have 1 divided by uh, 1 divided by 3 times 5 exponent negative 6. So this gives us a 66,666.6 carrying, which is approximately 67,000 hertz. This is 67 kilohertz. So the, our answer here is going to be uh, definitely, is it 67? 66,000 600, oh, sorry, this is per millimeter. Oops. Okay. I will change this to meter, millimeters, so that I don't, I don't waste time uh, converting per centimeter. So this will be, um, let me check this. So you must be very careful with these questions many times. So this will be five. Of course, we know that if one millimeter is five microseconds, that is per, per millimeter, that's what it means. 
and we know that one millimeter is going to be at uh, one divided by ten in centimeters. So one over ten centimeters is five microseconds. That means one centimeter is going to be five times ten uh, microseconds. Therefore, to change from per millimeter to per centimeter, I'll just multiply by ten. So this will be five. Uh, uh, this is going to be five. Let me check. Change it completely. So I will take the length, which is three centimeters, times the time base setting, which is five times ten, again times ten power negative six to change it to per centimeter. So this is going to be fifty microseconds per centimeter. This is what it means. So that is 5 times 10, which is 50, times 10 power negative 6 per centimeter, so that now per centimeter can cancel out. And if that is the case, I multiply this, um, I will divide this, so 1, again, divide by 3 times 50, 3 times 50, exponent negative 6. So that is 6,666, so this is... Error. So six thousand six hundred sixty-six, six thousand six hundred sixty-six. That is six point seven times ten power three. So that is six point seven times ten power three, which is approximately six point seven kilo kilohertz. Therefore, our answer is going to be C. So there is a need for, uh, for giving questions much care or being very attentive when reading the question. The table contains statements about stationary and progressive waves. Which row is correct? Remember, a stationary wave does not transfer energy. A progressive wave does. A stationary wave has nodes and antinodes. A progressive wave does not. Particles between adjacent nodes are in phase for a stationary wave. It is not the same with a progressive wave. So which row is correct? All particles vibrate with the same amplitude for a stationary wave. That is not true. Every particle, the, the amplitude varies from zero at the nodes to maximum at the antinodes. So A is wrong. Energy is transferred along the wave. For a stationary wave, no energy is transferred. B is wrong. Particles in adjacent loops vibrate in antiphase. That is very true for stationary wave. If you have two loops, they are saying particles in adjacent loops. So this is one loop and the second one. Particles here vibrate in antiphase with particles in the neighboring loop. In other words, antiphase means 180 degrees out of phase. That statement is true, but then... Particles vibrate in phase with their immediate neighbors. This one is not true. If a progressive wave, particles do not vibrate in phase with their immediate neighbors. It is only true for stationary waves. All particles in this loop here vibrate in phase. That means particles vibrate in phase with their immediate neighbors in a stationary wave, but not in a progressive wave. Therefore, our answer here is going to be D. Particles, one wavelength apart, vibrate in phase. That one is very true. If I take this point and its corresponding point here, that is one wavelength apart. Of course, those particles are permanently at rest. So if I take this and uh, I take a nant node in the next segment here, particles in these two are going to be vibrating in phase. Particles one wavelength apart because the distance between uh, uh, the distance between two adjacent antinodes is half wavelength. Then that means this is half and another half, giving us full wavelength. So the uh, particles one wavelength apart vibrate in phase, which is true. Particles one wavelength apart vibrate in phase. It is also true for a progressive wave. Which electromagnetic wave would cause the most significant diffraction effect for an atomic lattice of spacing 10 power negative 10 meters? So we look for radiations whose wavelength is very close to 10 power negative 10, and that is automatically X-rays. The wavelength of X-rays are many times quoted as 10 power negative 10, 10 power negative 11 meters.
So we know for diffraction to be maximum, the wavelength should be approximately the same as the size of the gap. So uh, the interatomic spacing is 10 power negative 10, so it means a, part, a, a radiation with a wavelength close to 10 power negative 10 would undergo diffraction. That's why we also have what we call electron diffraction in, in quantum physics. Waves generator, wave generators at point X and Y produce water waves of the same wavelength. At point Z, the waves from X have the same amplitude as the waves from Y. If they have the same amplitude, the moment they meet here with the destructive interference, the amplitude will be zero. Since they have the same amplitude for destructive interference, the amplitude will be zero. For constructive interference, the amplitude will be twice. Distance xz and yz are as shown here. Okay? When the wave generators operate in phase, the amplitude of oscillation at z is zero. When they operate in phase. What could be the wavelength of the waves? So first of all, we have seen uh, there is destructive interference here. We are having zero amplitude. And we know that for destructive interference, the path difference must be equal to uh, n plus a half times lambda. n plus a half times lambda. So uh, for, the for the maxima, for the intensity to be zero, that is going to be, um, for, the, uh, for the amplitude to be zero, that is destructive interference, so it means we have options. Remember, in this case, n can be equal to 0, 1, 2, and so on and so forth. So let's first find uh, the path difference. The path difference, lambda, uh, sigma, is going to be equal to 34 minus 24. 34 minus 24, which gives us 10 centimeters. Remember, for, the, uh, for uh, here to be zero, there must be destructive interference. So we are saying 10 centimeters should be equal to n plus a half lambda, a half into lambda. So we can check. We can check for n equals to zero. For n equals to zero, what is lambda? Lambda is going to be uh, 10 times 2 which is equal to 20 centimeters. And 20 centimeters is not indicated here, so we shall not, we shall not consider that. Then let's check the second one. For n equals to one, then what is wavelength? Wavelength is going to be 10 times, um, of course, uh, one plus a half is three over two. So 10 times two divided by three, which will be 20 over three. And 20 divided by 3 is 6.7. 6.7 centimeters, which is not there. We can check n equals to 2. For n equals to 2, lambda is going to be 10 times 2 divided by. So 2 plus a half is 5 over 2. So this would be times 2 over 5 which is going to be 20 divided by 5, which gives us 4, and we are seeing 4 there. So our answer is going to be C. The wavelength is going to be 4 centimeters. Note how I arrived at this wavelength very carefully. The path difference for destructive interference can be given as, a, given as n plus a half into lambda for lambda equals to 0, 1, 2, and so on and so forth. So I have been checking. Suppose lambda is 0, is the wavelength one of these ones? Suppose lambda is two, one, two, and three. You can check uh, the next one, and you see if it will be one of these. We can verify why can't it be two or three. Let's check for n equals to three. If n is three, it means the three plus a half, that is seven over two. So it means lambda is going to be 10 times two divided by uh, seven. So we have 20, Divide by 7, which is 2.885, which is not one of these values. Therefore, our answer is going to be C. A light meter measures the intense I of the light incident on it 
theory suggests that i varies inversely as the square of, of d. So i is inversely uh, proportional to the square of d. So in other words, it can't be a straight line because of the square, that's number one. And as d increases, I, I as d increases, I must decrease. Therefore, we eliminate straight lines here. We eliminate straight lines. It will not be a straight line because of the square. No. Which graph is which of the graph supports this relationship? Let's go back here. A light meter measures the intensity I of the light incident on it. Theory suggests that I varies inversely as the square of the distance. I varies inversely as the square of the distance. Okay, so this is a graph of I over D, yes. As D increases, I is, I is decreasing, but let's check. So I is going to be equal to a constant over D squared. Suppose here we are seeing um, we are seeing there is a certain value of i for which d is zero. There is a certain value of i for which d is zero. And what happens when d tends to zero? As d tends to zero, it means i will be equal to a constant divided by zero squared, which is going to be equal to infinity. That means um, okay, so this is graph is showing that I is uh, actually here. This it is not uh, it is showing that I is inversely proportional to D, not squared. This one is also showing that I is inversely proportional to D, but it is showing that there is a uh, a value of d for which the intensity becomes zero. There's a value for d for which the intensity becomes zero. And yet this one is showing that i is directly proportional to one over d squared. I think I will take c rather than n of these, these graphs. So this graph is showing that i is directly proportional. i is directly proportional to one over d squared. That would be a straight line through the origin. If 1 over d squared is 0, i is going to be 0. When is 1 over d squared going to be 0? That is maybe when d tends to infinity, that is 1 over infinity is going to give us 0. So it means when d, when d is, when d tends to infinity, it means 1 over d squared is going to be 0. That means, uh, when 1 over d squared is 0, it means i is going to be 0. That is a straight line. This one is showing that i, there's a point where i at d equals to 0, i can be a certain value. And there's a certain value for d squared where i is going to be 0. That means the most appropriate answer is going to be c, because c is showing i is directly proportional to 1 over d squared, which is the same as saying i is inversely proportional to d squared. The sound wave is displayed on the screen of a cathedral oscilloscope as shown here. The time based setting is 0 0.5 milliseconds per division. What is the frequency of the sound wave? So let's check. So for one cycle, we have one, two, three boxes. That's for one cycle. And we want frequency, so frequency is equal to one over period, which is one over L times X. L is length representing one cycle, which is going to be one, two, three divisions. So that is three divisions. Time based setting is 0 0.5 milliseconds per division. So that would be 0 0.5 times 10 power negative three seconds per division. So per division cancels out. So we have one divided by three times 0 0.5 exponent negative 3. So that gives us 666.6 recurring, which is 670. That is 
666.7, which is 6766. Part of a car was damaged by heating when, when on a sunny day, and the, the car was left in front of a curved mirrored building, which focused reflected sunlight onto the car. Which statement about sunlight correctly explains this observation? Sunlight contains infrared. I think that is the most appropriate answer. Because if it was on a sunny day and the car was left in front of a curved mirror, we know that infrared um, light, infrared light changes uh, temperature of a body, changes internal temperature of, a, I mean, internal energy of a body. It agitates uh, atoms, making up the substance, thereby increasing the temperature. Sunlight contains ultraviolet radiation. Yes, it is true, but that does not, that cannot damage the car. Sunlight is a longitudinal wave. That is not true. It is transverse. Sunlight is a transverse standing wave. It may be transverse, but not standing. It carries energy. And it cannot carry energy when again it is a standing wave. So the answer is going to be A. Sunlight contains infrared radiation. We know infrared radiation changes the temperature of an object. A student sets up an experiment to investigate double slit interference of light, but finds that the interference fringes observed on the screen are too close to each other. That is, X is very small. Which change would help the student to distinguish the fringes? So from wavelength equals to AX divided by D, because it's a double slit. So we know that X is directly proportional to lambda. They want the change that would help the student to distinguish the fringes. In other words, to increase X. So we either increase wavelength, we either increase D, or we decrease A. A must decrease. Wavelength can increase and D can increase. Decrease the distance S between the two slits. That is decreasing A because A is the slit separation. When we decrease A, it automatically means we increase X because we see A is inversely proportional to X from this expression. So making A smaller means that X increases. So the answer is most probably A. Increasing the width of the each slit, that one just increases the intensity incident on the screen. Move the screen closer to the, the light source, that means reducing D. No, move the screen closer to the light source. It means we are also we are reducing D. That one increases, decreases X. Use a blue filter instead of red filter. Blue has a lower wavelength. We have reduced the wavelength. Reducing the wavelength decreases X. So the answer is going to be A. Ships have been damaged by water waves with large amplitudes. These waves could have been uh, formed by adding the displacement of smaller waves. Which term describes this phenomenon? That is automatically superposition. Superposition, uh, that is adding displacements, that is superposition. Wider waves of wavelength lambda are diffracted as they pass through a gap of width d in a barrier. Which combination of wavelength and gap width would produce the greatest angle of diffraction? For maximum diffraction, lambda should be approximately the same as the size of the gap. Lambda should be approximately the same as the size of the gap for maximum diffraction. Okay, so let's look for um, which uh, which arrangement will uh, actually would produce the greatest angle of diffraction. So we are saying uh, a half half of the of diameter. I mean, uh, they say the width is d, half d, and twice wavelength. So the size of the gap is very small, is half of the, uh, the width pass through a gap of width D. Which combination of wavelength and gap width would produce the greatest angle of diffraction? In other words, we are saying reduce the, the gap by a half and double the wavelength. 
reduce the gap by half and double the wavelength. Okay, that means now um, the wavelength is has been increased. But remember, these are water waves. The wavelength has been increased, and we have reduced the size of the gap. That could also that could cause more diffraction. The gap has been reduced, and the wavelength has also been reduced. Where the water waves have a smaller wavelength. Now, when you reduce it further, it means um, they may be, the wave fronts may be very very close that they can just pass through the size the, uh, the gap. Then double. Double the width and double the wavelength. That one may not give a good, uh, because the water waves have a smaller wavelength. So doubling the width, it means we are increasing the size of the gap. And even if we double the width of the wavelength, there is almost no effect. Then double the gap and reduce the wavelength. This one actually reduces the, the angle of diffraction. So the most appropriate is this one here. Yes. Have the width of the gap smaller and slightly increase, double the wavelength. Because water waves have a very small wavelength. Doubling the wavelength, it means you have increased it so that it is very close to the size of the gap. So our answer is going to be A. The diagram shows two complete pulses on the screen of a CRO. A grid of one centimeter squares covers the screen. The time base setting is one microsecond per centimeter. How long does each pulse last? How long does each pulse last? Let's think of a pulse starting from this point and stopping at this point. So this is covering two cycles. So we want how long, that is time. Time representing the length of one, uh, one pulse is, is lasting for two centimeters times the time base setting, which is one times 10 power. Oh, they want it in micro, so I will leave micro here. So this is one micro seconds per centimeter. And this is automatically giving us two goes per centimeter as canceled. That is two microseconds. So one pulse is lasting for two microseconds. Which of the following wave motions may be used to de demonstrate the phenomenon of polarization? A sound wave. Sound wave sound does not undergo polarization. A surface wave in water, a surface wave in water, in a water ripple tank. A surface wave in a water ripple tank. It is not really very easy to use water waves to show a polarization. A stationary wave in an organ pipe. An organ pipe, that is already sound. Sound waves do not show a polarization. A stationary wave on a stretched wire. This one can show polarization because remember polarization means a confining vibrations in only one plane. If we have a string uh, vibrating like that, it can be made to vibrate even in the horizontal plane, in the horizontal plane. But if the vibration, if our, we make um, a certain path, which is vertical, it, it means only vibrations in the vertical emerge through and those ones in the horizontal plane will not pass through. That is polarization. You must have demonstrated this with your teacher using a rope in class, where a rope would be made to vibrate in the horizontal plane or in a vertical plane. If we put barriers vertically, it means when we displace the rope in the horizontal, the vibrations in the horizontal do not pass through. Actually, we would see the rope emerging as a straight, a straight it will be straight when it emerges. But if we displace the rope up and down, because our barriers are parallel, they are vertical, if we displace the rope up and down, we shall see vibrations which are actually up and down. So polarization can be shown by a stationary wave on a stretched wire. The diagram shows the screen of a CRO displaying a wave. The time base of the CRO is set to 10 milliseconds per degree. What is the frequency of the wave? So we know that frequency is going to be 1 over period, which is 1 over the length of one cycle. You can look for one cycle here. Now, invest, uh, coming up with one cycle here may not be very easy, but we are going to try. So one cycle.
Okay, so we are going to be forced to estimate. We are going to be forced to estimate, so we shall save very, very close to these ones because there is no clear point where we could estimate one cycle. So if I take this point as the starting point, then the next point is going to be here. So this is almost one, two, three, four, and I will say four point, approximately four and a half. So 4.5 uh, divisions are representing one, two, why should I take four and a half divisions? Let me take one, Okay, let me just take this point here and this point here. So that is one cycle, one, two, three, four, four point something. I would say about 4.2, 4.3. 3 divisions are representing one cycle. So uh, if I want the frequency, I will find the period is the length representing one cycle is 4.3 divisions times uh, the time base setting which is 10 milliseconds per division so per division has cancelled so it means the period is approximately four it's approximately 43 milliseconds so let's find the frequency frequency is one over period which is one over 43 times 10 power negative 3 note that i've just estimated for one cycle so i'll need a value very close so this is going to be one divided by 43 exponent negative 3 which is 23.25 that means our answer is going to be uh, most likely our answer is going to be most likely 24 hertz so our answer is most likely 24 hertz because we just made an estimate so frequency is approximately 24 hertz approximately 24 hertz p is a source emitting infrared radiation and q is a source emitting ultraviolet radiation the figures in the table are uh, suggested values for wavelength of uh, p and q so p is infrared and q is ultraviolet ultraviolet that is ultraviolet Rumenera's mother is visiting Uncle Xavier's garden. This is ultraviolet, that is after violet of the visible spectrum. Note that violet is 4 times 10 power negative 7 meters. So it means the frequency of uh, the wavelength of ultraviolet should be uh, less than 4 times 10 power negative 7. So we check, we start with the Q. If the wavelength is not uh, of a power smaller than negative 7, then we ignore. Unfortunately, both of them are powers smaller than negative 7. So we have to check using, um, but of course we know power negative 10, that is x rays. So we have negative 8. Then on the left hand side, we have to check uh, for P, which is infrared. Infrared is just after red. Remember, red is 7 times 10 power negative 7 meters. So it means it should have a bigger power than uh, negative 7. So it means it should be at least negative 5 because negative 7 is in the visible spectrum. So this is visible, this is visible spectrum. So our answer is going to be A. The diagram shows a tuning fork above a tube of air of length 25 centimeters. A stationary wave is set up in the tube with the same frequency as the tuning fork. The lower end of the tube is sealed. This is the minimum wavelength of the tube with the lower end sealed that creates a stationary wave. So if this is the minimum, we can see the minimum. We shall have one node at the other end and an antinode at the open end, which would mean 25 is equal to a a quarter of a cycle. This is a quarter of a cycle, which is like this. Because a half would be like that, and so on and so forth. 
which which are, are lengths of which other lengths of tubes sealed at their lower end will also create a stationary wave. Okay, so it means uh, here we are seeing that the length L for the fundamental is going to be a quarter of wavelength. The length L is going to be a quarter of wavelength. So it means uh, for the next one, for the next one, because which other lengths of tubes sealed at their lower end will also create a stationary wave. So let's check other lengths. If we were to increase, if we were to increase, we saw that we have more, uh, we have more, uh, the second one, let's have a node at the closed end. This means this length L, L2 may be, is going to be a half plus a quarter, a half plus a quarter, those are three quarters, three over four of wavelength. It means the next value of L is going to be three times one over four lambda. So it means in general for a closed pipe, the LN is going to be equal to N times one over four lambda where n should be an odd number. n should be an odd number, such as the start, the first one is 1, the second one is 3, the next one should be 5, the next one should be 6, I mean 7, and so on and so forth. So if this is L1, the next one should be n, which is an odd number, times L. So it means this one, uh, this one is saying 37.5, uh, 37.5 and 50 centimeters. That will not, 37.5 is not, um, is not going to be one of these odd numbers times 25, because one over L is 25. So LN is going to be N times 25 centimeters, where N must be an odd number. Uh -huh. So we have 50, that is n equals to 2, and 75, 75 divided by 25, let's check, 75 divided by 25, that is 3, that would mean n equals to 3, okay, n equals to 3, for 50, it means n equals to 2. And remember, we don't have 2 here. 2 is an even number. So this one is wrong. So, so although 75 is 3, this is 3. 100 is also going to give us an even number, which is 4. 100 divided by 25, that is 4. 4 is an even number. We don't need that one. Then 75 and 125. 75 is 3. n is 3. Then uh, 125. Divide by 25, that is 5. N is 5, so our answer is going to be D. For a closed pipe, N should be an odd number. For the lengths of the pipe, which are forming stationary waves, N should be an odd number. White light consists of many wavelengths. The wavelength of red light is R. Of red light R is approximately twice the wavelength of violet light V. Okay. When white light is incident normal on diffraction grating, several spectra can be uh, formed. Which diagram shows the possible distributions of light in the first order and second order spectra? First order and second order spectra. Of course, we know that. Uh, for a diffraction grating, n lambda is equal to d sine theta, which means sine theta is equal to n lambda over d. And for the same wavelength, uh, I mean for red, of course, if we look at red, theta uh, sine theta, sine theta for red is going to be greater, is going to be n times uh, wavelength of red divide by d. Remember, um, we are looking at, we are looking at first order and second order spectra. So it means for red, 
because the red is having a longer wavelength, uh, it means its angle is going always going to be far away from the central from the center. So it means red cannot be close to red cannot be close to this to the white spectrum at the center. So this one is wrong. It should be violet, which it should be violet, which should be at the center. Uh, at the center, we cannot have red here. We must have white. At the center, we must have always white because all travel the same distance and form a white spot at the center. At the center, we have white, then violet. Here it is showing we have violet at the center. It should always be white. Then, uh, of course, if it is white, above it and below it, there uh, are continuous spectrum ranging from violet to red. Because violet has a smaller wavelength, it is going to be closer to the central white spot. Therefore, our answer is going to be C. Since sine theta is directly proportional to wavelength, and theta is directly proportional to wavelength, it means uh, wave, violet, which has a smaller wavelength, will give a smaller angle from the central white spot. Therefore, violet should be close to the central white spot. So the answer is going to be C. To produce a stationary wave, two waves must travel in opposite directions through the same space. Which statement about the properties of the two waves must also be true? Two waves must travel in opposite directions through the same space to produce a stationary wave. First of all, these waves must have the same amplitude. If we are to have um, a zero points of uh, of zero vibration or points of uh, nodes, if I'm to put it like that, these waves should have the same frequency. They should have the same uh, wavelength. So let's check for such qualities. Equal frequency but different speeds. The speed should be the same. The waves must have equal speed but different wavelength. The wavelength and the frequency should be the same. The waves must have equal speed. Frequency and wavelength. That is true for stationary wave. Equal speed, frequency, and wavelength moving in opposite directions, meeting at a point. When all the other features of the wave are constant, which relationship is correct? Amplitude is directly proportional to velocity. That is not true. Intensity is directly proportional to amplitude. We know that intensity is directly proportional to amplitude when amplitude is squared. So this is also not true. Velocity is directly proportional to wavelength. We know that V is equal to lambda F. When all other features of the wave are constant, that means if the wavelength is constant, V is going to be directly proportional to wave, and I think that is true. Wavelength is directly proportional to frequency. That is not true. Wavelength is inversely proportional to frequency. A vibrating rod makes a water wave in a ripple tank. The graph shows the displacement of the wave at one instant as it travels away from the rod. The rod speed is 2 centimeters per second. What is the frequency of the wave? All we need from this graph, since it is displacement against distance, we are going to find the wavelength. Which wavelength is 0 0.8 centimeters? So we know that V is equal to lambda times F. That means uh, F is going to be V, which is 2 centimeters. Uh, so that will be 2 times 10 power negative, times 10 power negative 2 divide by the wavelength, which wavelength is going to be 0 0.8, or why did I convert? Okay, the wavelength will be 0 0.8 times 10 power negative 2, so I'll just say 2 divided by 0 0.8, which is going to be 2.5 hertz, so our answer is 2.5 hertz. Polarization is a phenomenon associated with a certain type of wave. Which condition must be fulfilled if a wave is to be polarized? It must be a light wave. It may also be a wave on a string or on a rope. So that one is not true. It must be longitudinal. Longitudinal waves do not undergo polarization. It must be a radio wave. It could also be a microwave. So that is not true. It must be transverse. So 
Radio waves are transverse, light waves are transverse. All transverse waves can undergo polarization. When a chromatic light passes through two narrow slits and produces an interference pattern on a screen some distance away, the interference fringes are very close. They are very close. So since it is two narrow slits, that is a double slit, lambda is equal to Ax divided by D. What change would increase distance between the fringes? So to make X bigger, lambda should either be bigger, D should also be bigger because X is directed proportion to D. Maybe some people may not be seeing how they are directed proportion. So if we want X to be higher, this should be higher or that should be higher. And this should be smaller because they are inversely proportional. Increase the brightness of the light source that just affects the intensity. Increase the distance between the slits and the screen. Increasing that distance makes X to be greater, so this is correct. Increase the distance between the two slits. When we increase A, the distance between the two slits is A. When we increase A, we just decrease X. Increase the frequency of the light used. When we increase F, it means lambda decreases. That would mean X decreases. So our answer would be B. The following statements describe the diffraction of waves passing through a narrow slit. Which statement is not correct? Diffraction of waves passing through a narrow slit. Both transverse and longitudinal waves and, uh, uh, can be diffracted. That is very true. All waves can undergo diffraction. Diffraction can only be seen when li with light when the light is monochromatic. That is very true. If we want to see diffraction, then we should use monochromatic light. That's when we shall see interference patterns. If you use light which changes phase abruptly, then we cannot see uh, the effect of diffraction. Red light diffracts through a greater angle than blue light. Uh, that is very true. Red light diffracts through a greater angle than blue light because we note that uh, for diffraction grating, n lambda is equal to d sine theta. Because red has a greater wavelength, then sine theta is also greater. So this is correct. Ray, um, sorry, putting a tip on a wrong one. So I'm saying this is correct. The angle of diffraction increases when the width of the slit decreases. The width of the slit, when the width of the slit decreases, the angle of diffraction decreases when the width of the slit decreases. So when the width of the slit decreases, remember n lambda, I mean when the width of the slit decreases, remember n lambda is equal to d, which is 1 over n sine theta. So we are saying the angle of diffraction, that is sine theta, that is theta decreases when the width of the slit decreases. So uh, when we take n the other side, we have n times lambda times capital N is equal to sine theta. So if the width of the slit decreases, it means it means we shall have uh, now more value, more more slits. We shall have more slits, and if we have more slits, it means the sine of the angle also becomes smaller. So it means this is also correct. So both we have seen that both transverse and longitudinal waves can be diffracted. Diffraction can only be seen with light when the light is monochromatic. So this is where there is a problem because the question is which statement is not correct. Diffraction can only be seen with light. In the first place, it may not be. It is also seen with water waves when the light is monochromatic. Even if light is not monochromatic, diffraction can be seen only that we may not be able to see interference patterns or regions of maxima and minima 
but still the light can spread into regions of geometric shadow, so this is not correct. Monochromatic light is incident, uh, I mean, is directed onto a pair of slits. Interference fringes that are two millimeters apart are observed on a distant screen. So two millimeters apart, that is X. The frequency of the light used is, is then doubled. So that means the wavelength is halved. And the slit separation is halved. How far apart are the new interference fringes? So it is a pair of slits. So we use lambda is equal to AX over D. So let's say the first one, it is monochromatic light. So wavelength lambda is equal to um, the first slit separation is A. The first value of X is 2 millimeters. I'll just say 2 divided by the distance D. Then for the same wavelength again, uh, the slit separation is halved. So we have a half A. That means X is what we want to find. I'll quote X2. Then the distance, the frequency, oh, sorry. The frequency of the light used is then doubled and the slit separation is halved. How far apart are the new interference fringes? So that means these remaining the same. Wavelength is, is doubled. So because the frequency is doubled, the wavelength is halved. So this is going to be a half lambda. Frequency is inversely proportional to wavelength. If the frequency is doubled, the wavelength must be halved. To combine these two equations, I will simply say where there is lambda, I will put a, I will put a, a or 2a divided by d, 2a divided by d is going to be equal to a half a times x2 divided by d. So d cancels, a cancels. So this side I have 1. So we notice that um, x, if you are very observant, you notice that x has remained 2. So x2 is still 2. So it means x2 is going to be 2 millimeters. When you take this to the other side, it is going to be 2 millimeters. So the answer is still 2 millimeters. A diffraction grating has n lines per unit length and is placed at 90 degrees to monochromatic light of wavelength lambda. What is the expression for theta, the angle to the normal, the angle to the normal, I mean, angle to the normal to the grating at which the third order diffraction peak is observed. So if this is the diffraction grating and the monochromatic light is incident normal to the grating, so it's, we expect at the center to have the zero order, then we are saying what is the expression for theta, the angle to the normal, the angle to the normal to the grating, because the normal to the grating is this horizontal line here. So one theta, where n is equal to 3. So that is very easy. n times lambda is equal to d sine theta. But remember, d is 1 over, over capital N. So it means sine theta is going to be n times lambda. Remember, I said d is 1 over capital N. So it means we multiply both sides. So this will be times n. Remember, small n is, is going to be 3. So this means sine theta is going to be 3 times lambda times capital N. And this makes our answer to be C. Which statement about longitudinal waves is correct? Longitudinal waves include radio waves. Radio waves are transverse. Particles in longitudinal waves in a longitudinal wave vibrate at right angles, that is a characteristic of transverse. Some types of longitudinal waves can be polarized, that is not true. There's only transverse waves which can be polarized. Stationary waves can be produced by the superposition of longitudinal waves, that is true. All waves can, under, can produce stationary waves, that's why we have resonance in pipes. The order of magnitude of the frequency of the longest wavelength ultraviolet waves can be expressed as 10 power x hertz. What is the value of x? Let's first estimate the wavelength um, because they have said the magnitude of the frequency of the longest wavelength ultraviolet waves. 
So the question does not want wavelength, it wants frequency, but we can use the wavelength to estimate the frequency. Ultraviolet, that is after violet. Remember, violet has a wavelength of 10 power negative 7, that is 4 times 10 power negative 7. Then after violet, we expect a wavelength of about 10 power negative 6, I mean negative 8, on the right hand side of our violet, because Rumenera's mother is visiting Uncle Xavier's garden. To this side, the wavelength decreases, decrease in wavelength. So ultraviolet should have a frequent a wavelength less than 10 power negative 7, such as 10 power negative 8. So let's now find the frequency. Frequency will be speed, which is 3 times 10 power 8, divided by 10 power negative 8, which gives us 3 times 10 power 16. So we look for a value close to 16, and it is most likely going to be 15. Now somebody will say, why not uh, 17? You can check with 17. Suppose it is power 17. What will be the wavelength? That is That will be the most important thing. The speed V of waves in deep water is given by that equation. V squared is equal to 0 over 2 pi. Where lambda is the wavelength of the waves and G is the acceleration of free fall. A student measures the wavelength lambda and the frequency f of a number of these waves. Which graph should he plot to give a straight line through the origin? So we know that v is equal to lambda times f. When we square, we shall get lambda squared f squared. So lambda squared f squared is going to be equal to g times lambda over 2 pi. So lambda has cancelled with that square. So I have that f squared is going to be equal to g divided by 2 pi times 1 over lambda. Compare with y equals to mx plus c. So there is no y-intercept. So on the y-axis, this student can sketch f squared. On the x-axis, the student can sketch uh, 1 over lambda. And that will be a straight line through the origin, whose gradient will be g over 2 pi. So the student will sketch d. A parallel beam of white light passes through a diffraction grating. Orange light of wavelength 600 nanometers in the fourth order. So small n is equal to 4. Diffraction maximum coincides with the blue in the fifth order. So here n is equal to 5. What is the wavelength of the blue light? So we are, this is the diffraction grating, so n lambda is equal to d sine theta. So we shall, we shall assume that d is the same, and they are coinciding, that means sine theta is also the same. So for uh, orange, wavelength is 600 nanometers times n, that is the 4, that is 4 times n is equal to d sine theta. Then for blue, the wavelength is, uh, the order is 5. The wavelength is not known and should also be equal to d sine sine theta. So we combine the two equations because on the right hand side we have two d sine theta. So this implies that the wavelength lambda is going to be 4 times 600 divided by 5. 4 times 600 divided by 5. That is 480. So our answer is going to be b. The basic principle of basic principle of mode production in a horn is set is to set up a stationary wave in an air cone. For any note produced by the horn, a node is formed at the mouthpiece and an ant node is formed at the bell. A node is formed at the mouthpiece. And an ant node at the bell. The frequency of the lowest node is 75. What are the frequencies of the next two higher notes for the air column? They said a note, the best principle of a note production in a horn is to set up a stationary wave in an air column. For any note produced by the horn, a node is formed at the mouthpiece, and an antinode 
is formed at the bell. So if we look at that scenario, whenever there is an antinode, one, uh, one node and an antinode, it means this length here, L is corresponding to uh, a quarter of wavelength, meaning the fundamental frequency F is going to be V divided by um, wavelength, which is going to be 4 times L. So the question is, what are the frequencies of the next two higher nodes for this air column? You notice that this for, uh, for it is behaving like a closed pipe, and for a closed pipe, Fn is equal to n times the fundamental, where n is an odd number. n should be 1, uh, 3, uh, seven, uh, 5, 7, 9, and so on and so forth. Because if we found the second frequency, uh, we expect the next frequency will be 3 times v over 4l. The next one will be 5 times v over 4l. So that means n should be an odd number. So we check. Uh, for n equals to 1, the first frequency is 75. For n equals to 3, the second frequency will be 75 times 3, which is 225. Um, the first, that means the first higher note, because this is the same as the fundamental, the first higher note is 225. So the answer is automatically going to be D. Without testation, the answer is D, because the first higher note is 225, which is... Uh, 75 times 3. A CRO is connected to an alternating voltage. The following trace is produced. The oscilloscope time base setting is 0 0.5 milliseconds per centimeter. The Y plate sensitivity is 2 volts per centimeter. Which statement about alternating voltage is correct? The amplitude is 3.5 centimeters. We can check with the amplitude. We have one, two, three, and a half. The amplitude is 3.5 centimeters times the set the Y sensitivity, which is two volts per centimeter. So the amplitude is going to be 7.0 volts. So this one is not correct. The frequency is 0 0.5 kilohertz. We can check the frequency. Frequency is going to be 1 over period. What is the period? The period is going to be the length representing one cycle times the time base setting. So we have 1, 2, 3, 4. That is one cycle starting from this point up to that point. So those are 4 centimeters. Time base setting is 0 0.5 times 10 power negative 3 seconds per centimeter. A centimeter cancels. So that is the period. So the frequency will be 1 over 4 times 0 0.5 times 10 power negative 3. 1 divided by 4 times 0 0.5 exponent negative 3, which gives us 500. So this is 500 hertz, and 500 is the same as 0 0.5 kilo kilohertz. So the answer is B. What to two significant figures are the period and frequency and the amplitude of the wave represented by the graph? Period, frequency, amplitude. The easiest to start with is the amplitude. So this is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. Uh, it is around uh, 6. 0.4, approximately 6.4. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. No, not 6.4, approximately 6.8. It's almost um, the second, the, the seventh square is almost filled, so it's approximately 6.8 millimeters. But we shall check. Approximately 6.8 millimeters. Okay, so it means we have this one and this one. We ignore this one here. Then for, for we can check one, or we can check uh, the period. So we can check the period. We can check the period. Let me look, I'm looking for a more convenient point. If we start from here, one cycle, 
stops there and the second cycle or you can even look at this point here and this point they are corresponding points so i can take readings from that point so this is one two three four one two three four the scale on the x-axis is 0 0.2 divide uh, that is so this is 0 0.8 and this is if this is 4 this is going to be 4.2 so i have 4.2 minus 0 0.8 4.2 minus 0 0.8 which is 3.4 so that means my period should be very close to 3.4 so most likely it is going to be uh, 0 0.0035 so the most appropriate is this one because this one is close to 0 0.3.4 milliseconds because I just estimated this point and this point for one cycle so the most appropriate answer is going to be C A sound wave consists of a series of moving pressure variations from the normal constant air pressure. The graph shows these pressure variations for two waves at one instant in time. Okay. Wave 1 has intensity 1.6 times 10 to the negative 6. What is the intensity of wave 2? Remember, um, This is a graph of pressure variation against distance. Pressure variation against distance. So I, I want you to note that when the pressure is maximum, it means the displacement. Um, okay. So what is the intensity of wave 2? We have seen that uh, wave 1 has an intensity of 1.6 times 10 power negative 6. And this is a graph. A sound wave consists of a series of moving pressure variations from the normal constant air pressure. Where the pressure is maximum, where the pressure is maximum, it means the particles are very close to, together. At that point, we would expect a compression. We would expect a compression. And where the pressure is minimum, we would expect a rarefaction. We would expect a rarefaction. That means this distance is still going to be directly proportional to the amplitude. So we know that intensity is directly proportional to amplitude squared. So this, uh, the pressure variation is going to be directly proportional to the amplitude itself. Therefore, therefore, intensity for the first wave, a uh, wave one, is equal to a constant, which is, is 1.6 times 10 power negative 6, is going to be a constant times the corresponding amplitude, which is going to be 2 times 10 power negative 2, and this is squared. Then, for the second one, its intensity i is going to be the same constant times uh, the amplitude is, is approximately 3 times 10 power negative 2, and this is also squared. So we just combine these two. We just combine these two equations, either by dividing or substituting for the constant. So i is going to simply be equal to, um, I'm dividing the two equations, so it will be 2 times 10 power negative 2 squared divided by 3 times 10 power negative 2 squared then times 1.6 times 10 power negative 6 so uh, the 2 power negative 2 was cancelled I only have 2 divided by 3 and I square the answer and I multiply this by 1.6 exponent negative 6 I calculated this correctly. This is 2, the other one is 3. 
So we have, oh, I reversed this. I divided the i by the other one, so it should be the other round. So this should be 3 and this should be 2. Because I divided the second equation by the first equation, so this should be 3 divided by 2. Okay. So this is 3 divided by 2 squared, which is 2.2 .2 times 1.6 exponent negative 6, which is 3.6. So i is 3.6 times 10 power negative, negative 6. So our answer is going to be c. Okay, so 3.6 times 10 power negative 6, our answer is going to be C. I said the amplitude is directly proportional to the pressure variation. Where the pressure variation is uh, maximum, the amplitude also is going to be greater, and so on and so forth. The diagram shows a vertical cross section through a water wave moving from left to right. At which point is the water moving? Upwards with maximum speed. Upwards with maximum speed. So the diagram is showing the vertical cross section through a water wave moving from left. So it is moving from left, left to right. So because the wave is moving from left to right, at which point is the water wave moving upwards with maximum speed? So the particle at this point here is vibrating downwards, and the particles after B are vibrating upwards. So at which point in the wave is the water wave moving upwards with the maximum speed? So at B, it is moving downwards, but with the minimum speed. At D, it is moving upwards with almost no speed. So it means our answer is going to be C, because particles on the other side of the wave are vibrating upwards. So the water is moving upwards with the maximum speed at point C. At point A, it is moving downwards, although it is still move, it is moving with the maximum speed. So the answer is C. Our answer here is going to be C. The principle of superposition states that a certain quantity is added when two or more waves meet at a point. Of course, that quantity is displacement, not amplitude. It is the displacements which are added because amplitude is, refers to maximum displacement. But a particle may not have reached the maximum displacement. It may have a different displacement. Light passes through a diffraction grating ruled at 1,000 lines per centimeter. So that is 1,000 times 100 lines per meter. And the same wavelength of light also passes through two narrow slits. 0 0.5 millimeters apart. So this is distance between two narrow slits for a diffraction grating, that is D. Both situations produce intensity maxima and minima on a screen. Which statement about the separation of the maxima on the screen and the sharpness of the maxima is correct? Sharpness means uh, uh, it is easy to see the maxima on the screen or distinguishing it from uh, a minima. The diffraction grating maxima are less widely spaced and are less sharp than the two slit maxima. So let's check. For diffraction grating, n lambda is equal to d sine theta. For a, a double slit, for double slit, we have uh, lambda is equal to a x divided by d. Now, for uh, 
a diffraction grating because there are more lines it means the image is going to be more sharp so we can start by looking at sharpness there is more intensity of light passing through for many lines so for a diffraction grating the image is more sharp so where we see less sharp that one we can cancel it out the diffraction grating maxima are less wide less spaced and are sharper the diffraction grating maxima are less widely spaced and they are sharper than the two slit maxima yes they are sharper they are sharper but the distance between them is very small that's why uh, they, are, they are less widely spaced that means this also does not work the diffraction grating maxima are more widely spaced that is very true when you say they are less widely spaced, that is not true. They are more widely spaced. That's why we, we measure their angle rather than their separation. And they are also, when you say they are less widely, then you are contradicting. They are more widely, but they are also more sharper. So they are more widely spaced and are sharper than two slit maxima. So the answer is going to be D. The diagram shows an experiment which has been set up. To demonstrate two source interference. Microwaves of wavelength lambda pass through two slits S1 and S2. The detector is moved from point O in the direction of the arrow. The signal detected decreases until the detector reaches point X and then starts to increase. So it means that X we have a, a, an intensity minimum destructive interference is found there which equation correctly determines the position of x suppose we have a, a destructive interference there then the path difference between s1 uh, to x and s2 to x should give us n plus a half lambda that is for destructive interference where n can start from 0 1 2 and so on and so forth so let's check. The path difference is going to be S2x minus S1x because S2 is greater. So this one, we ignore this one, or x and that one. Then the path difference should be one of these. For n equals to 0, the path difference is going to be lambda over 2 when n is 0. So the answer is going to be D. The answer there would be D because for n equals to 0, path difference, uh, I mean wavelength, will be lambda over 2. This one, of course, is, the, is constructive interference. So we, 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 we can't expect a minimum there when the path difference is equal to lambda. That is constructive interference, which would give a maximum. The display on a Sierra O shows the signal produced by an electronic circuit. The time base is set at 5 nanoseconds per division and the Y gain at 10 volts per division. What is the frequency of the signal? So we know frequency is going to be 1 over P, which is 1 over the length of the cycle times the time base setting, which is 1 over length of one cycle. This is 1, 2, 3, 4. Those are four divisions representing one cycle times the time base setting which is 5 times 10 power negative 9 because it is nanoseconds per division per division has cancelled so our frequency will be 1 divided by 4 times 5 exponent negative 9 which gives us a 5 that is 5 uh, is it 50 1 2 3 50,000. So that is 5, 50,000, which is 5.0 times 10 power 7. That is 50, not 50,000, 50 millions. So the answer is going to be C. A cathode ray oscilloscope displays a waveform corresponding to a sound wave. In order to determine the frequency of the sound wave, which part of the displayed waveform must be measured? And which CRO setting must be known? So, 
A cathode oscilloscope displays a waveform corresponding to a sound wave. In order to determine a frequency, we need a time-based setting. We need a time-based setting, so we are... Uh, in order to determine the frequency of the sound wave, which part of the displayed waveform must be measured and which CRO setting must be known. So the CRO setting must be the time base, not the Y gain. The Y gain gives us amplitude. Then which part of the displayed waveform must be measured? So uh, somebody is saying uh, here we have wavelength. Uh, this one is automatically wrong because we ignored B and D. So here we have wavelength and amplitude, and our answer is going to be wavelength. Amplitude will give us, um, when we measure the amplitude on the screen, then we're actually measuring the amplitude of the, of the wave, not uh, the frequency. But when we measure the wavelength, then we can find, uh, and you use the time-based setting, then we can find uh, the period. What is the approximate range of frequencies of infrared? Of course, we can use simple elimination, but it is hard to eliminate to check using frequencies. But wavelengths, we can. So wavelength, Rumenera's mother is visiting Uncle Xavier's garden. For visible, running, ranging from red, it is 7 times 10 power negative 7 meters, meaning infrared must be approximately 10 power negative 6, around 10 power negative 6 or negative 5. So let's check 10 power negative 6 for frequency. So frequency is going to be 3 times 10 power 8, that is the speed, divided by 10 power negative 6. So this is going to be 3 times 10 power 14. So we must, uh, the range should be up to around 14, 15. So it means uh, this is going to be wrong. This is going to be wrong. This is already above 14. So our answer is going to be C. A small source emits spherical waves. The wave intensity I at any point P, a distance R from the source is inversely proportional to R squared. So we are seeing I is inversely proportional to R squared, or I is equal to a constant over R squared. What is the relationship between the wave amplitude A and the distance R? We also know that intensity is directly proportional to amplitude squared, meaning intensity is equal to a constant times amplitude squared. So I can just equate these two. So K times A squared is equal to K over R squared, so K cancels. And it means when I find a square to both sides, A is equal to um, okay, let me leave there my K. Of course, these values of K are going to be different. So let this be K1, that is K2. So this is this means A is going to be, of course, the root. In other words, I just want you to see that A is inversely proportional to R because you remove the square root both sides. A is inversely proportional to R, so the answer is going to automatically be B. I is inversely proportional to R squared, but I is also directly proportional to A squared, which means A squared is directly pro inversely proportional to 1 over R squared. Therefore, A is going to be inversely proportional to R. A student attempts to measure... I mean, to show the interference of light using two identical green LEDs, that is, light-emitting diodes. Which statement explains why the experiment will not succeed? Identical, of course, there are two sources, even though they are identical, they will never produce coherent, so they will never produce coherent light. Which statement explains why the experiment will not succeed? Number one. The light waves from the sources are not coherent. They can never be coherent. So the answer is A. As long as there are two different sources, even if they are perfectly identical, light does not maintain a constant phase difference from two different sources. However identical they are, the phase changes abruptly at a, in around 10 power negative 9 seconds or nanoseconds which our eyes cannot follow such rapid changes. 
A stationary wave is set up in a stretched string as shown here. Which statement about the points on the string is correct? P, Q, R, and S. Point Q vibrates with the largest amplitude. Point Q. No, that is not true. The largest amplitude is around here. Point P and R vibrate in phase. Let's check. This one is 180 degrees out of phase with this one. That means this one and this one are in phase. This one and this one will be in phase. I think that statement is that statement is correct. Point P is in this segment. It is in phase with points in the other segment, but out of phase with the points in this segment. Points in this segment vibrate in phase with points in this segment, but 180 degrees out of phase with the points in the neighboring segment. So the answer is going to be B. Monochromatic light is incident on a diffraction grating and a diffraction pattern is observed. Which line of the table gives the effect of replacing the grating with one that has more lines per, me per meter? So for diffraction grating, we know that N lambda is equal to D sine theta. Which line of the table gives the effect of replacing the grating with one that has more lines per meter? N times lambda is equal to where there is D we put one over the number of lines sine of theta. So it means we have increased the number of lines. So if we increase the number of lines, either um, sine theta, because they are directly proportional, sine theta increases. So number of orders of diffraction visible. The number of orders decrease. Yes, that one is true because they are inversely proportional. So this one this one is not true. We are seeing that small n is inversely proportional to up to n. So when this increases, this one decreases. So we have eliminated D, C and D because it shows n, small n increases. Then the angle. We see that when I take capital N on the left hand side, n is directly proportional to sine theta. Remember we have increased this one here. It means this one should also increase. So our answer is going to be B. Uh, the number of orders decreases, but the angle between the first and the second orders of diffraction increases. So theta increases. Which statement about electromagnetic radiation is correct? Waves of wavelength 5 times 10 power negative 9 meters are high energy gamma rays. Negative 9 is approximately the, either X rays or uh, ultraviolet. So that is not true. Waves of wavelength 3 times 10 power negative 8 are ultraviolet. I think that is very true. Waves of wavelength 5 times 10 power negative 7 are infrared. Negative 7, that is approximately a blue or green light. So that is visible spectrum. So this is not true. Waves of wavelength 10, 9 times 10 power negative 7 uh, light waves that is on uh, 9 times 10 power negative 7 is uh, very close it is just after red it is it is uh, slightly beyond a red light it is close to infrared so our answer is going to be b which statement describes a situation when polarization could not occur A situation when polarization could not occur. Light waves are reflected. Light waves are scattered. Microwaves pass through a metal grid. Sound waves pass through a metal grid. Sound waves are longitudinal. They cannot undergo polarization. So the answer is D. A stationary sound wave is produced in a tube. Which statement describes the wave? It is the distance between two adjacent nodes divided by the period of the wave. Let's check. V is equal to lambda times F, which is equal to lambda over T. But remember the distance between two adjacent antinodes is equal to half wavelength, which means the wavelength is going to be twice distance between two adjacent antinodes. So it means this is going to be V equals to twice 
distance between two adjacent antinodes divided by t. It is the distance between two adjacent antinodes divided by the period. It should be twice. So this one is not correct. It is the speed at which energy is transferred. It is the speed at which energy is transferred from one antinode to an adjacent antinode. Wave speed. The distance at which energy is transferred from one antinode to an adjacent antinode. That is not uh, wave speed. It is the speed of a particle at an antinode. That is not a wave speed. It is the speed of one of the progressive waves that are producing the stationary wave. That is what we call the wave speed. If it is a stationary wave, a wave speed is the speed of the progressive wave. If it is a progressive wave, then wave speed refers to the speed of a wave front on that progressive wave. So if it is a stationary wave, a wave speed refers to the speed of the progressive waves that are producing the stationary wave. So the speed of the wave which is stationary is actually the speed of the progressive waves that are producing that stationary wave. Which statement about waves is correct? All electromagnetic waves travel at the same speed. That is very true. All electromagnetic tra waves travel at the speed of, of light. The question is, which statement describes the situation? I mean, which statement which statement about waves is correct? All electromagnetic waves travel at the same speed in the vacuum. That is correct. Longitudinal waves can be polarized. That is not correct. The amplitude of a wave is directly proportional to the energy transferred by the wave. That is not very correct. The frequency of infrared light is greater than the frequency of ultraviolet. We can check that one. Frequency of infrared is greater than the frequency of ultraviolet. We can check. Infrared, wavelength is about 10 power negative 6. Ultraviolet, wavelength is about 10 power negative 8. Frequency is equal to V over lambda, 3 times 10 power 8. Divide by 10 power negative 6. This gives us 10 power negative power positive 14. The other one will give us 10 power 16. The frequency of infrared is greater than the frequency of ultraviolet. That is not true. So our answer is going to be A. The variation with the distance x of the intensity i along a stationary sound wave in air is shown by that graph. The speed of sound in air is 340. What is the frequency of the sound wave? Frequency. So this is giving us intensity against distance, which is going to give us wavelength. And they've given us the speed. So we see that the wavelength is going to be from 5 to 115. That is one cycle. So the wavelength is 10 centimeters. So we can now find the frequency as lambda times f. I mean, uh, from lambda, frequency is v over lambda. So this is going to be v, which is 340, over lambda, which is 10, times 10 power negative 2. So 340 divided by 10 exponent negative 2. That is uh, 3,400 hertz. So the answer here is going to be c. Is it C? Let me check again. Oh, shit. This is a stationary wave. No, it is not C. It is a stationary. If it was a progressive wave, it would be C. Now it is stationary. Let's check again. So if it is stationary, it means this is where the intensity is zero. This is a node, and this is also a node. Distance between two adjacent nodes is a half wavelength. So this is a half wavelength. 
distance between two adjacent nodes is half wavelength, which means the wavelength is going to be twice that distance, which is 2 times 10, which is 20 centimeters. So this should be 20, not, not 10, because it's a stationary. If it was a progressive wave, this would be wavelength. But since it is a stationary wave, where the intensity is zero, it is a node. Distance between two successive nodes is a half wavelength. So that means um, this should be, uh, I'll just divide that by another, okay. I will say 340 divided by 20 exponent negative 2. Okay, so this is going to be uh, 1,700. So be very careful. Not be very careful to identify whether it is a stationary wave or a progressive wave. So if it is a progressive wave, where you see amplitude is zero, just know that is a node. Where you see intensity is zero, just know that is a node. And distance between two successive nodes is a half wavelength. Look at this situation here, where this is a loop. And this is a node, and this is a node. That is half a cycle. Distance between two successive nodes is half wavelength. So it means full wavelength will be that distance times two. Okay, plane wave fronts in a ripple tank pass through a gap as shown in that figure. Which property of the wave will be different at point at Q compared with P? Which property? So of course the speed does not change for when diffraction occurs. Uh, the frequency does not change because the wavelength does not change. The only thing that we expect to change uh, at point Q will be uh, probably the amplitude. So the answer here is going to be C. Probably the amplitude may change because the, the speed of the wave does not change because it has met a barrier, it, it remains the same. And the wavelength for diffraction, the wavelength does not change. Since V is equal to lambda F, speed is constant, the wavelength is not, is not changed, it means F has also not changed. It is only the amplitude which may change at that point. An organ pipe of length L is open at both ends. Nodes are produced by the pipe when stationary waves are set up. The speed of sound in the air is that. What's the lowest frequency of the node? So let's draw an open pipe here. So we expect an antinode here and an antinode here. For the lowest node, we expect one node in between, something like this. And this is a quarter cycle plus a quarter cycle is half a cycle. So the length L is equal to half a cycle. So meaning lambda is equal to twice L. So frequency is equal to V over wavelength, which is V over 2L. And V over 2L makes the answer to be C. Interference fringes are produced on a screen by double slit interference using light of wavelength 600 nanometers. The fringe separation is 4 millimeters and the separation of the slits is 0 0.6 0 millimeters. What is the distance between the double slit and the screen? Distance between the double slit and the screen, that is capital D. It is a double slit, so lambda is equal to A times X divided by D. We want D. Interference fringes are produced on the screen by a double slit interference using light of 600 nanometers. So wavelength is 600 times 10 power negative 9. The fringe separation is 4 millimeters, that is X. So X is 4 millimeters and A is 0 0.6. 0 0.6 times 10 power negative 3, 4 times 10 power negative 3 divided by D. So I'll just make it the subject, 0 0.6 exponent negative 3 times 4 exponent negative 3 divided by 600 exponent negative 9. So this is giving us uh, 4 meters, so our answer is going to be D. I mean, uh, yes, D is equal to 4 meters, the answer is D. The order of magnitude of the frequency of the shortest wavelength of visual light waves can be expressed as 10 power x hertz. I think we have answered such a question. What is the value of x? It is uh, the shortest wavelength of visual light. 
The shortest wavelength of visible light is uh, violet, which violet has wavelength as 4 times 10 power negative 7 in meters. Let's now check the frequency. So the frequency of violet is going to be V, which is 3 times 10 power 8, the speed, divided by 4 times 10 power negative 7, which gives us, um, uh, that is 0 0.3 divided by 4, that is 0 0.75 times 10 power uh, 7, 8 plus 7, that is 15. So the order of magnitude of the frequency of the shortest wavelength of visible light waves can be expressed as 10 power x. So most likely this is going to be d, 10 power 15. 10 power 15 because uh, if... Okay, it is 10 power 15 because this is 10 power 15. So this is approximately 10 power 15. If we if we were to ignore this 4 here, the order remains 10 power 15. The diagram shows two waves, X and Y. Wave X has amplitude 8 centimeters. So wave X is this one, this is 8 centimeters. So you notice that this is almost half of 8. So wave Y should have amplitude of 4. So we ignore this one here. If X has 8 centimeters, Y should have approximately 4. So I ignore A and B. Then what are the amplitude and frequency of wave Y? The frequency of wave X is 100 hertz. And notice that the frequency of wave X is half. In, one, in half a cycle of wave Y, I mean wave X, we have two cycles. So it means frequency of X is half frequency of Y. Because in half a cycle of X, you have two cycles. So the frequency of, of X is half the frequency of Y. So now we want the frequency of Y. It means the frequency of Y is twice the frequency of X. So that will be 2. Um, that will be... Two wave X has amplitude eight centimeters and frequency one hundred hertz. So it means the frequency of wave Y should be higher because here it is not a, uh, here it is one hundred. We don't have two hundred here, but we expected it to be two hundred. Since the value which is above one hundred is three hundred, then our answer is going to be D. But we literally see that here it is almost, if we start from here, that is one cycle and a half. No, it is less than, it is not two, it is not twice, but it is greater. I'll say Fx is less than Fy. The frequency of Fx is less than the frequency of Fy. That means the frequency of Fy should be greater than Fx. It should be greater than 100 hertz. So our answer is going to be D. It may not necessarily be 200 because here I see if it is not really 200. It is greater. What is correct for all transverse waves? They are all electromagnetic. That's not true. We can have a transverse waves on a rope which are not electromagnetic. They can all be polarized. That is the most appropriate answer. They can all travel through a vacuum. Not all of them are formed in a vacuum. For example, water waves. Waves on a rope. They're not traveling through a vacuum. They, are, they all involve the oscillation of atoms. There could be no atoms in electromagnetic waves. A transmitter of electromagnetic waves is placed 45 centimeters from a reflective surface. So we see the reflective surface here. The, emitter wave, the emitted waves have a frequency of 1 gigahertz. A stationary wave is produced. A stationary wave is produced with a node at the transmitter and, an, and a node at the surface. So there is a node here at the transmitter and a node at the reflecting surface. How many antinodes 
are in the space between the transmitter and the surface. How many ant nodes are in the space between the transmitter and? So the emitted waves have frequency 1 gigahertz. A stationary wave is produced with a node at the transmitter and a node at the surface. There is a node at the transmitter and a node at the surface. How many antinodes are in the space between the transmitter and the surface? Okay. So the, it is which type of wave? It is electromagnetic. And this, the, the, we can first find the wavelength. So wavelength is equal to uh, speed, which is 3 times 10 power 8, divided by the frequency, which is 1 times 10 power 6. No, giga is power 9. So we can verify the wavelength. So this is 3, uh, 3 exponent 8, divided by 1 exponent 9. So the wavelength is going to be 0 0.3 in meters, approximately 3 centimeters. Okay. So how many antinodes? Remember the distance between two successive nodes is half wavelength. Distance between a node and another node is half wavelength. Distance between a node and another node is half wavelength. So how many such distances fit in this length here? So half wavelength, distance between two nodes is half wavelength. That means um, if the wavelength is 3 centimeters, the distance between two successive nodes is going to be uh, 1.5. So this is 1.5 centimeters. Distance between two successive nodes is 1.5 centimeters. So how many nodes are there? Number of nodes. Let's first find the distances here. This is going to be 45 divided by 1.5. How many loops are these ones? 45 divided by 1.5. Those are going to be 30. 30 loops. Those are going to be 30 loops. For example, this is one loop. This distance is um, this distance is going to be um, 1.5 centimeters. So count such 30 times. That means the number of remember for every the distance between every two antinodes gives us I mean two nodes gives us there is always a, a, an antinode there. So the question is, how many antinodes? Oh, by the way, this was 0 0.3 meters. Did I change it correctly? 0 0.3 times 1 meter is 100 centimeters. Sorry, this is 30. So this is going to be um, 15. I was wondering why it was too big. So 45 by 15. That is three. So we have one there. We have two. And we have three. That is 15 plus 15 plus 15. So this is an antinode here. There's an antinode there. There's an antinode there. So the number of nodes, I mean number of loops. This is not number of nodes. Number of loops is going to be one, two, three. This gives us 45 centimeters. So these are one, two, three, four antinodes, I mean nodes, which gives us three nodes. Normally the number of nodes is always greater than the number of antinodes by one. So our answer here is precisely going to be three. So we have seen that there are uh, three loops. We go to the distance, uh, the distance between the transmitter and the reflector, and we divide that distance by the, dis the length of just one loop. One loop is the distance between one node and the next node, which is 15 centimeters. That gives us three loops, and in every loop there's an antinode, so there are three antinodes. 
A teacher sets up um, the apparatus shown to demonstrate a two slit interference pattern on the screen. Which change to the apparatus will increase the fringe spacing? Let's check. We know it is a double slit. So lambda is equal to ax divided by d. We want to increase x. We either increase lambda, we increase d, or decrease a. So a has been written as q. Decrease the distance p. Uh, that one does not change anything. Distance d is given as r. So I'll say lambda is equal to q times x over r. So we must increase lambda, we increase r, or decrease q. Decreasing p does not affect anything. Decreasing q increases x, so the answer is going to be b. When it, q becomes smaller, x increases because they are inversely proportional. So decreasing distance q. Monochromatic light of wavelength 5 times 10 power 5.3 exponent negative 7 is incident normally on a diffraction grating. The first order maximum is observed at an angle of 15.4 degrees to the direction of the incident light. What is the angle between the first and second order diffraction maximum? So you notice that this question could have been repeated several times. So uh, we are, it is a diffraction grating where n lambda is equal to d sine theta. So the first order, so n is 1, and is observed. So n is 1 times wavelength, which is 5 times 5.3 times 10 power negative 7 is equal to d sine of 15.4. What is the angle between the first and the second order? Now we are going to replace n with the 2, so 2 times the wavelength, which is 5.3 times 10 power negative 7 is equal to d sine of theta. We can divide the two equations. When we divide the two equations, we have that sine theta divided by sine of 15.4 is equal to this one cancels out, is equal to 2 over 1. So theta is going to be the sine inverse of 2 sine 15.4 so theta is the sine inverse 2 sine 15.4 then we get the sine inverse that is 32 so theta is equal to 32 this is actually theta 2 32.32.4 32 degrees now we want the angle between the first and the second order. So if I sketch this, this is the diffraction grating, that is the screen. So this is the first order, n is equal to 1. This is the angle, theta 1. Second order, n is equal to 2. The angle, theta 2, is measured from there up to there, that is theta 2. So theta, this is the difference between the two angles. So the difference is going to be 32.1 minus 15.4. So difference in the angle theta is 32.1 minus 15.4. 32.1 minus 15.4, which is 16.7. So our answer is going to be C. A wave has a frequency of 5 gigahertz. What is the period of the wave? So frequency is 5 gigahertz. What is the period of the wave? So period is equal to 1 over F. Period is capital T, is 1 over F, which is 1 over 5 times 10 power negative, I mean power 9, because it is giga. That is power 9. Okay, so 1 divided by 5 exponent 9, and that is 2 times 10 power negative 10. Uh, seconds. Now we have answers as micro, nano, and pico. I think uh, the answer is automatically D. We can verify. So this is 2 times 10 power negative 10 divided by pico is 10 power negative 12. 
to bring in a prefix, you divide by its value. So that is divide by 1 exponent negative 12, which is 200 pico. So the answer is 200 picoseconds. The y input terminal of a cathode ray oscilloscope. The y input terminals of a cathode ray oscilloscope are connected to a supply of amplitude 5 volts and frequency 50. The time base is set at 10 milliseconds per division and the y gain is 5 volts per division. We said it is connected to an amplitude of 5 volts. So the, uh, and the y get the y gain is at 5 volts per division. So one division is 5 volts. Which trace is obtained? So our trace should be one division vertical in the in the vertical because the amplitude is 5 volts and yet the y gain is also 5 volts per division. So this is less than a, 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 a division. This is less than a division. So we have to choose between C and D. We check the frequency. The frequency is 50 hertz. The frequency is 50 hertz. The time base setting is 10 milliseconds per division. So let's find the period. Period is equal to 1 over F, which is the length representing one cycle times the time base setting. This is number of divisions. So period is going to be 1 over F, which F is 50. So we have 1 divided by 50 is equal to the number of divisions times the time base setting, which has been given as 10 milliseconds per division. So this is L in divisions times 10 milliseconds. So times 10 milliseconds per division. We just want the number of divisions. Now note that frequency is in, pass in seconds. So this will be times 10 power negative 3 seconds per division. So we want L. So L is going to be um, 1 divided by 50 divide by 10 exponent negative 3. Those are 2. So it means uh, L is going to be equal to 2 divisions. So L should be 2 divisions. And D is showing 2 divisions. C is showing uh, that one cycle is represented by 1 division. So C is wrong. Our correct answer is going to be D. Our correct answer is D. A wave has speed 340 meters per second and period 0 0.28 milliseconds. What is its wavelength? So V is equal to lambda times F, which is equal to lambda divided by T. This means that the wavelength lambda is going to be V times T, which is going to be 340 times 0 0.28 times 10 power negative 3. So 340 times 0 0.28 exponent negative 3, which gives us 0 0.095 in meters. So our answer is going to be A, 0 0.0952 meters. Which line in the table summarizes the change in wave characteristics on going from infrared to ultraviolet in the electromagnetic spectrum. Which line in the table summarizes the change in wave characteristics on going from infrared to ultraviolet? Of course, from infrared to ultraviolet, the frequency is the one which is increasing, the wavelength is decreasing from Rumenera's mother is visiting Uncle Xavier's garden. So infrared, to ultraviolet, this side wavelength decreases, frequency is increasing. So A is showing frequency decreases, it is actually increasing. Frequency is increasing from infrared to wavelength, I mean to ultraviolet. Then the speed, of course, the speed is constant, the speed is not increasing, so the answer is going to be C. Light of wavelength 600 nanometers is incident on a pair of slits. Fringes with spacing 4 millimeters are formed on the screen. What will be the fringe spacing when the wavelength of the light is changed to 400? So it is a pair of slits. So we use uh, Young's double slit e equation. Lambda is equal to AX divided by D. So we have 600 
is equal to a the spacing slit separation is a times the fringe is four millimeters i will not convert that divide by d what will be the fringe spacing that is x when the wavelength is 400 equaling to a times x divided by d we divide the two equations or we just substitute a over d with 600 over 4. So we have that 400 is equal to 600 divided by 4 times x. 600 divided by 4.0 times x. So it means x is going to be 400 nanometers over 600 nanometers times 4. So we have 400 divided by 600 times 4 which gives us, uh, is it two point? Let's check this again. Six hundred divided by four, four times six hundred, Four times four hundred divided by six hundred. That is two point. I'm getting two point six six. Six hundred nanometers is the twenty pair of slits. Fringe spacing of four millimeters. Let me do uh, exact better equations. Let me do simple algebra. Okay, so the wavelength is 600 is equal to the slit separation A times the fringe spacing, which is 4, divided by the distance between, um, with a spacing of 4 millimeters are formed on the screen, divided by the distance D. What would be the spacing when the wavelength of the light is changed to 400 and the slit separation is doubled? Okay, so that is 400. The slit separation is twice A doubled times X, which is the fringe separation. The slit separation is doubled, so this is over D. Okay, now we can combine these two equations. This equation means whenever I see A over D, it is 600 divided by 4. So I'm going to substitute. So I have that 400 is equal to twice into a over D is 600 divided by 4, then times X. So I want X, okay. So X is going to be 400 times 4 divided by 2 times 600. I'm making X the subject, which is 1.3 recurring. So X is 1.3 recurring. So the answer is going to be A. Lastly, in part uh, 6, the speed of a transverse wave on a stretched string can be changed by adjusting the tension of the string. A stationary wave pattern is set up on a string using uh, an oscillator set at a frequency of 650 hertz. How must the wave be changed to maintain the same stationary wave pattern if the applied frequency is increased to 750 hertz? How must the wave be changed to maintain the same stationary wave pattern if the applied frequency is increased to 750 hertz? So to maintain the same stationary, the same pattern, it means we are maintaining the same wavelength. We are maintaining the same wavelength. So uh, we know that um, V is equal to lambda times F. If wavelength is constant, V is directly proportional to F. Note that the frequency has been increased. What does that imply? It means uh, the speed must also be changed. If the frequency has been increased, the speed should also be increased. So this one is saying the decrease the speed, that is not true. Decrease the wavelength, the wavelength should be constant because we want the same stationary wave pattern increase the speed of the wave. So we should increase the speed of the wave. Therefore, 
our answer is going to be C. I think part uh, seven, uh, episode six should stop here and see you in the last episode, which will be episode seven, I think. I hope you have learned something. For any errors, you can always write to me. I'm bound to make errors because I also recall these lessons when I have been exhausted by the days. So the, I expect some errors. Some points I may not explain them to your expectation. Those errors are expected. Nevertheless, I try my level best. However, have a good night and bye-bye.